Thank you, everyone, for being here. Namaste. My name is Adya. I'm the director of Symbiosis Center for Management Studies, BBA Institute, and I welcome you all. Three days of knowledge, discussion, debates, networking, learning, and relearning, and so much more. I'm excited, honored to welcome you to our next informative session of the conference where we dig into the fascinating world of non-formal third space literacies, a rising trend that is capturing minds and transforming the educational landscape. The popularity of non-formal third space literacies is also an indication of how learning is evolving and how people are seeking different options in order to develop and build their skills. The community aspect has also played an integral role in the popularity of non-formal third space literacies. Overall, the growing popularity of non-formal third space literacies highlights the importance of creating diverse and accessible learning environment, yet it has its own challenges. Are there concerns about lack of standardization? Are there concerns about quality control? Is there any potential tension between the formal and the informal sector? COIL is an effective practice in this space, but is it easy to adopt? With this background, I welcome the esteemed panel. May I welcome on stage Mr. Raghav Gupta, MD, Coursera, India. Thank you, Mr. Gupta, for joining us today. Professor Paul Henry Gundani, Vice Chancellor, Zimbabwe Open University, Zimbabwe. Thank you, Professor Gundani, for joining us today. Dr. Sharon Guan, Assistant Vice President for Center for Teaching and Learning, DePaul University, USA. Looking forward to learn so much from you. Professor Minakshi Dalmia, Co-Founder, Chief Education Officer, DLRC, Pune, India. Thank you, Professor Minakshi. Ms. Vajanti Sankar, Founder and Executive Director, Center for Science of Student Learning, Bangalore, India. Thank you for joining us here today. Mr. Gupta, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Radhya. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, excited to be kicking off the second half of the day. I know we are the proverbial post-lunch session, um, so my request to all the panel members has been to keep it interesting, to keep it crisp. Uh, we're going to try and do uh, two, three things. Uh, so we are, of course, going to talk about the growing popularity of non-formal uh, third space literacies. Um, it's a lot of words, so we'll try and understand what does this mean, firstly, what are non-formal third space literacies. Um, secondly, uh, we are, we'll also talk a little bit about will these stay non-formal or will these become formal in the future as well? Um, I represent an online education company uh, it's a fairly large company, Coursera. Uh, I believe it is fairly formal, so we'll talk a little bit about how much of this will stay non-formal and how much uh, will become formal. Um, I have a diverse group of panel members. Uh, you know, we have, of course, geographic representation from around the world, Zimbabwe, US, India, and so on. And then we'll also hear perspectives from school education, uh, college education, and also a little bit about uh, workforce skilling and professional education as well. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, canvas that we will try and paint for you. Um, I think most of the panel members have uh, PowerPoint-based slides, uh, so I'm going to request each person to take about nine to 10 minutes. We'll start off with uh, Professor Sharon first. And uh, you know we'll then have a bit of a discussion amongst ourselves, and then I'd love to open it up for Q&A. Uh, I have, we have a hard stop, uh, 3.45, so that's the time that we will use, or earlier if we can. We have an exciting valedictory address coming up as well. So to kick us off, let me invite uh, Dr. Sh Sharon Guan. She's the AVP for Center for Teaching and Learning, DePaul University in the US. And I know she's going to be talking about futurizing higher education. So would love to get you started. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'm debating whether I should be sitting or standing. So we'll see. I'll keep the sitting position until I get too pumped. I'll get up and dance then. Um, so my uh, presentation is called uh, Futurize Higher Education by Bringing Living into Learning. Um, that actually involved 
four areas of higher education. That is the curriculum, the pedagogy. By the way, my mentor told me, don't use pedagogy if you can use instruction. Anytime you can explain things plainly, don't use jargon. So I, uh, as an instructional designer to begin with, I use instruction. And then the teacher, and then the organization. So basically, I'm talking about the what, the how, the who, and the where. The where. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the curriculum first. Learning, I think, is existential or experiential um, in nature. And it become even more so in the future. Um, I want to show you um, a piece of statistics. 85% of the jobs for 2030 is, is not, do not exist yet, okay? Where did, did I get this piece of data? It's because one day, my rebellion teenage son told me that, and I thought he made that up. So I have to do my research and Google, and I did find that. Um, he, br he brought up that piece of data in an argument with me because he wrote an essay called School is Useless. And he got an A for it, you know, thanks to the open mind uh, high school teacher. How could you get, um, you know, an A for that kind of a title? And uh, that is one of the few A's this boy ever got. And he actually challenged me. He said, why A matters? And my answer to him was, because you're Asian. <laughs> OK. Um, and in his essay, he did mention, um, you know, what is making him feel like school is useless? Um, he used the metaphor. He said, you know, these days we use gun and missiles to fight, but the teachers are still teaching us how to throw rocks. I'm, I'm like, you're lucky, you're not studying rocks. You know, the history of rocks. It's just throwing, is still fun. But that piece of information really reminded me that there is such a disconnection between what is happening in the world and what is being taught in the classroom. And while I'm coming here, there's another piece of data that I gathered. 44% of job key skills will change in the next five years. So the core skills in 44% of the jobs will change thanks to ChatGPT. I think that will be addressed in our group as well. And then how do we react to this? So you see companies are trying to do this kind of informal education to, to, as a reaction. When we are still talking about curriculum reform and change, we see companies offering working skills that can guarantee a job in two hours. That is fascinating and unbelievable. So the first day when I visited um, KPIT, I, um, I explained to Ravi and his team, I said, my husband, a senior, motor, uh, uh, um, software engineer told me that he can spend 10 days to train me to do his job. And I saw a lot of handshake shaking. It's just they don't believe me. I was just about to go back home and tell my husband he's a liar. But then I realized maybe both my husband and Ravi and his team are correct. Because my husband was talking about a special, you know, project skill you learn that like, quickly, and you will be able to handle that task. And Ravi and KPIT team, they're looking for employable engineers. So they're looking for people with the mindset. Skill is one thing, mindset is another. As, as my, um, um, you know, the person I admire the most is Dr. Lee Shulman. He wrote um, in his uh, philosophy of education that Vocational education teach the minimum of skills, but the goal really should teach the mindset of that profession. So to educate a person with the mindset of an engineer would take more than 
10 days. I believe so. Okay. So there are other uh, places in the United States that are training people with specific skills that directly link to employment. The guided project is a typical example. And then that leads to some thinking from my end. The systematic knowledge versus the expressional knowledge. The traditional format of content learning and the current format of building up a processor within this head, right? That enable you to contain any knowledge. So one is a processor building, the other is database building. Database building, meaning pouring your head with information or so-called knowledge, you can never beat ChatGTP. They will win you, okay? But the processor building, meaning you have a brain that can reflect, that can build relationship that is resilient. That is something beyond ChatGPT, and that is something that we should focus in our education, right? So the future view of education is school is actually should, should be on the classroom. And anyone I bump into could be my teacher. And the world that I'm exploring is the curriculum. Um, so I want to throw in another example. The American University of Carroll um, did a project where they asked students, how do you envision your class in 2040, uh, okay, not very far. These are a bunch of engineer students. So how do you envision your class be like in that, um, how long was that, 16, 16 years distance? And the answer is this list, okay? So when I look at the answers, I'm thinking, wow, at least two of them that were implementing at DePaul University where I've been um, working for 21 years. Uh, for example, the students really want to have their choice of modalities. I want to learn this way. I don't want to come up to cam campus. Maybe course Sarah can teach me better than core professor Sarah, right? So, um, and I want to combine that and to learn something that I feel more comfortable with. Um, so, that is happening, at least partially, at DePaul University, thanks to COVID, okay? So our online offering before COVID was 12.5%. During COVID was 96%. So you see that big jump. And then after COVID, people really think, okay, there are multiple ways that I can deliver instruction multiple ways that students can learn. So our teaching modality run from three, face-to-face, -face, online, and blended, to 11, okay? And we actually, it's too complicated, so we um, reduce that to eight of them. Basically, we're telling learners, there is no way for you to say you can't join the program. You say you don't have time, you can do it anytime. You say you can't drive, you don't have to drive. You say you have a learning disability, well, it's recorded. You can always like, review it, everything. So we covered every edge of it to make it flexible for learners. That's the future of learning. No one's gonna drive that far. No one's gonna fly that, from, that far away to a conference. They're here for a festival, right? If this weren't a festival, I would never come, right? For the sake of learning, I could have got enough from joining them online and watch all the recordings, right? So that makes us rethink the modality of teaching, learning, and professional development. Um, another part is students talk about the content being driven by student. I don't want Professor Hu and Hu to teach me anything. I want to come here and say, gosh, I want to learn this, you tell me. So I, being in the field of instructional technology and being kind of like, like a head of our Center for Teaching and Learning, I always look for a field 
um, you know, look for students as guinea pigs to practice what I uh, preach. So the department that I picked to practice that is called uh, Modern Language. And DePaul has a program. I'm not sure how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, Collaborative Online Instructional Learning, COIL. Show of hand. Oh gosh, take a nap. I'm going to explain, OK? Um, so this is a learning modality that allows all of us to use technology to connect students digitally. Okay, they don't have to visit a campus, but they can join the class remotely and be connected with the student. So that's the model that we've been encouraged faculty to use, and we have 226 projects already done. And in my Center for Teaching and Learning, we have a um, national award-winning program to train faculty to do this kind of learning design, to collaborate. My class was done that way, okay? So that's my partner, teaching partner in Tianjin Normal University. And in, in this language and culture class, we don't have a textbook. Um, I'm showing pictures of students writing on the board in the classroom the things they want to learn, okay? And they are voting things. We have five things listed, show of hands, what is the number one thing we should address? So topics of my class is driven by student. But how do they know where to find the topics, right? They're doing C++. They don't even know the fundamentals. Um, well, by connecting them with people from you know, a different culture who speaks the language they're learning, um, they are there in the field, and they come back to the classroom and ask me questions. Questions like, oh my God, people of that culture, they're so open. They, a, a guy told me, they hit on me. I'm like, oh, Joe, stop there. Joe said, well, both of them, girls, said I'm handsome openly in the WeChat, you know, or WhatsApp situation. I said, come down, Joe. That is um, basic culture courtesy to praise people for their appearance. That has nothing to do with romantic gesture, okay? That was my on-the-spot culture education. I'm gonna go back and tell them, you better be prepared because one, one of the days you're gonna visit India and this will prepare you for that kind of complimentary, right? Um, so it went very well. Students are communicating um, on a daily basis. They made friends with, with each other, especially during the COVID time. Um, and they just love it. So this is a model that based on experiential learning model that, that uh, David Cope developed many, many years ago. I think many of you um, are familiar with. You threw the people into the situation before teaching them. I'm at Pune. And then they got shocked. Okay, what are the food on the counter? Can I touch this? Will I be able to, you know, eat that? And they use their prior knowledge to try to guess what that is. Then they seek help in the classroom, asking people around. And you get that knowledge, then you generate. Then you have a, a dining uh, journal, okay, that, that's shareable. I can post online. You're generating knowledge. So you're pushing swimmers into the water first before you even show them the base, basic structure. That is called experiential learning. You give them a purpose to learn. They need a purpose. There is fundamental power of having a purpose. And this is um, showed by my impact analysis. I've been doing this for six years for a dozen of my courses, and you can see students' um, um, feedback on the helpfulness of culture and language learning showed on the screen now. Um, student feedback is amazing. They say, you know what? I never uh, thought that language can be learned this way. Your class doesn't feel like a class, but I learned so much. And, and um, 
my kids said, Mom, you're not normal. So I, I went to my class and I said, uh, what do you think? Am I normal? My students were like, eh. and one of them said, what's so good about normal? Okay. So I really feel like my goal is not to be a normal teacher. I want to be something above normal. And the learning needs to be something about, uh, above normal. So um, I'm not sure if this can be played. Um, no, it doesn't. But we dance in class. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're getting the end. Um, this is um, the, um, what we do in class. We start with a dance to get the body move and um, so your brain is ready for learning. Uh, my preparation for when I come back is to start an Indian song. song. And it goes like, Aki Kuli. How do I go with that? Aki Kuli Ho Ya Ho Ben. So I'm, I'm, I'm going there and I'm going to practice that. Oh. Um, so that shows that you, you as a teacher, your role is changing. Your role is changing from um, delivering the content to finding the entry point. Um, there's a book called Teaching Naked. Um, Jose Bowen, the author, said, the primary role of a professor is to find that entry point to learning. It's, just, it's like I find Anita to be my entry point to symbiosis and to India. Okay, so you need that entry point. Um, and that's about it. This is my last thing. So I talk about curriculum, I talk about instruction, and I talk about teacher. Now, as a university, as an organization, I think there are a lot of things that we need to change. In 1972, the Paul started a school for new learning, meaning uh, the program allowed students to bring what they had experienced in life to the classroom or to the program, and we did some kind of a trade calculation and generate a credit, class credit. So you don't have to relearn everything. You can bring your experience and treat them for class credit. That program is still evolving. You know, it's very early, uh, started very early, still evolving. But I do see that being the trend of education for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Wonderful points, Dr. Sharon. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you painted a wide uh, landscape on futurizing higher education. Thank you for covering those points. And I don't say this just because you said Coursera might be able to teach it better, but uh, genuinely. Um, one thing which uh, I thought, right, you said 85% of jobs in 2030 don't exist today. And I think one of the job titles which is being played around quite actively these days because of chat GPT is that of a prompt engineer. So we are seeing jobs getting created, you know, in front of us as we, as we speak as well. Um, I really liked how you showed the DePaul experience of um, also futurizing curriculum and your own experience of online going from, I think you said 12.5% to 96 to now 25. And uh, you might have seen this uh, regulation in India supports 40% of credits coming from online education. And we were talking earlier in the day about how the national education policy in India is such a futuristic looking uh, document that I think it kind of corroborates some of the points that you've shared uh, as well. But thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move us forward. Um, we'll go to Professor uh, Paul Henry Gundani next. Um, he's the Vice Chancellor of the Zimbabwe Open University. And uh, Professor Paul, you're going to be using slides as well. And I know you'll talk about your experiences with uh, e-learning um, LMS in the context of the Zimbabwean uh, economic challenges as well. I uh, would request you to keep it to 10 minutes. I want to make sure we have um, time for Q&A as well. Um, uh, so yeah, over to you. Good afternoon. My title is uh, Growing Popularity of Non-Formal Third Space, um, third, yes, Third Spaces. 
My presentation will focus mainly on the experience that we had as a university. So it's not so much non-formal, it has become, or what started as non-formal became formal. Uh, and this, this has to do with um, policy shifts that happened within the post-independence Zimbabwe after 1980. You might remember that uh, under a colonial setup, uh, we had a very bottlenecked system, which only had one university in the country. I myself went to the only university which was in the country for about six million people, one university. And the university would only take 250 uh, students per year. So the whole complement of students in the university would be about 1,250. Now, as, uh, post, as, as the government of, as the independent government uh, moved in, um, it was clear that um, the elitist form of education was not sustainable. And it was very clear that so many of the citizens were disenfranchised. And so, one way was to create other universities, but which are contact universities. But uh, 10 years down the line, the government realized that creating more universities, contact universities, was capital intensive. And of course, it uh, required a lot of investment into training of uh, lecturers and academics and support staff. We started off uh, actually having expatriate professors coming from all over, from Australia, from Europe, from America, to fill in the, man, uh, the manpower um, gap. But then somewhere in the mid-90s, the government then decided to move towards introducing distance, a distance university. And this is my university, the Zimbabwe Open University. And that university, for it to be uh, established, required a lot of um, progression. First pilot was to pilot it within an existing contact university as a distance center. And after a number of years, it became a distance college. And after a number of years, it became a university. It required training people into distance education and, of course, building capital, human capital, and also finding facilities, a physical infrastructure, where a university could be um, set up. And so, the Zimbabwe Open University was founded in 1999. We are turning 25 next year. In the first 20 years of its existence, the focus was basically on producing well-written modules um, where for you to draw up the curriculum, you needed to get experts. You outsource expertise, and these experts write for us and produce modules, and then distribute them using the post office um, and courier services. But what it meant was that uh, the idea was to address the question of equity, um, and, of course, um, access to create a more democratized access to higher education because many people had the qualifications, but there were not enough spaces for them to enroll in contact universities. So they opened the distance university, which actually was called Open University, Zimbabwe Open University as a distance university. That implies opening it up to the generality of citizens, many who were already working, 
but who could not access higher education in university. And many who were disadvantaged by gender, by social status, by remoteness of location, and by many other factors, by history. And then to say this university should be the, the space for all these people. And so the module, the philosophy which was adopted was simply that the module is the teacher. For 20 years, that was the philosophy. But in 2019, we decided to change from that. Part of the reasoning being that, yes, you could provide the module to a rural student, an urban student, a student who is a worker, who sets aside time at night to study, or who perhaps decides to meet their professor during the weekend for contact as a hybrid system. But um, what we have realized is that the module has its problems. It is teacher-centered. It is expert-centered because the people we hired to write the modules are experts. And then you have a teacher who becomes the facilitator, but the facilitator becomes again the center of the, the teaching and education that takes place. And we said in a 21st century, this perhaps is not the best way to do it. Let's go E, electronic or online. And the experiment started in 2019. The diagram there simply shows you how we tried to democratize by setting up centers across the country in each province and in each district, set up centers where we can actually meet our students if they want to consult um, on a certain issue or also to have tutorials. And, and so, when we moved from 2019 to adopt the e-learning approach, the idea was, of course, to link up with the general global trends which had gone digital. Of course, we wanted to also graduate students who are technologically empowered and well-equipped. And we adopted Moodle and uh, customized it for our own purposes. And we think that it is very uh, convenient. It is connected to our um, um, admission, uh, academic um, information, uh, ac academic registration information system. It is also connected to our accounting system, uh, which is a very, very upgraded fourth generation accounting systems. And it is also connected to our library uh, systems, which are also uh, mostly fourth generation systems, uh, latest cutting edge. However, as we do this delivery through the learning management, which we called My Vista, which we theoretically think is convenient, it is user-friendly, it is interactive, it gives feedback to the student and back to the lecturer, and of course, uh, students can do, uh, can study from their homes or from their workspaces. That's, I say theoretically, because uh, that's where I'm trying to go, to say, what are the challenges arising from that theoretical uh, grounding and perspective, where we think an up-to-date, um, uh, top-of-the-range learning management system is user-friendly, it has feedback, it is interactive, and so forth and so on. But uh, we have encountered a number of challenges, considering that um, we are not only looking after a Zimbabwean student, we are also looking after other students who are outside the country, virtually a good number of the challenges that we have met or we have faced include the following. One is the preparation of our educators. A good number of these educators went through the formal 
education, where they had to encounter a lecturer who actually is the source of knowledge. And they are participators uh, in the knowledge system, and they try to literally mimic exactly what they went through. So they are not ready for an online education delivery system. Uh, they are literally uh, digital immigrants, and yet we are facing some students who are digital natives. Some others are completely outside the circle of digitality and digitalization by virtue of their remoteness in the rural areas and so forth and so on, and cannot access smartphones. They don't have even iPads or, or a laptop. The cost, considering that our country economically is a developing country, uh, it's a poor, low middle class uh, country, you have to contend with these challenges of access, particularly through the uh, procurement of gadgets, uh, gadgets that are user-friendly for online education. And that became um, one very big problem. We are still dealing with that, and we are trying to find ways of procuring uh, gadgets which we can distribute to every student but if we were to do that still, there are other challenges, the broadband issues. In a poor country, in rural areas, in peri-urban centers, what about the internet? What about data? Um, so these are some of the challenges we are making, we are, we are facing. Of course, the cost of data itself, um, we have about four internet um, suppliers. Um, in the country, data is a commodity that is very expensive in Zimbabwe. And an ordinary student who is a mother in a rural area or even in a township, uh, township is a colonial history, uh, these are high density suburbs, um, not low density. It means that uh, when you talk of the income of the people, they are low income people. And so, do they privilege and prioritize education to the extent of buying extensive data in order to study? Those are some of the issues we are dealing with. But we are also looking at ICT investments and the cost. Um, it's, it's not easy for us as a university to have a sustainable ICT in infrastructure base uh, because it means raising the fees of the students. And if we are going to raise the fees, it means then we are limiting the question of access and we are also limiting the question of equity and because the cost is just too high. Finally, I am looking at some of the recommendations that we are making. We, we think that uh, it's important for us to understand our student base by way of uh, undertaking tracer studies so that we understand the students in order to come up with proper solutions for that student. Secondly, yes, it's important to have sustainable ways of capacitating our ICT infrastructure. Uh, and lastly, of course, it's important that we continue to upgrade these systems so that they don't become obsolete. And then, if they do so, we run into another problem. Um, so it's, it's, it's about running a dynamic institution. That is really where we are trying to go, but where our students remain satisfied and happy students. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing the Zimbabwe open story, uh, Professor Paul. And really appreciative of the equity and access that the university is providing. Um, we are seeing a very interesting, uh, I shouldn't say experiment, but it is three years old, so it is an experiment in the sense in India as well. Uh, top universities are now launching online programs, and some of them are seeing amazing success. So IIT Madras has uh, a BSc data science program that launched three years ago. IIT Madras is one of the top engineering institutions in the country. 
and there are 16,000 students enrolled in that. And from what I hear, the learner feedback is very positive as well. So lots to happen in just generally the open online learning space, uh, but uh, great to hear your story. I'm going to change gears a little bit, uh, move to K-12. And if I can invite uh, uh, Professor Minakshi Dalmia, uh, who is the co-founder and chief education officer of DLRC. I know you're doing some very interesting things in K-12. I uh, would love to ask you to introduce DLRC as well. I'm sure a lot of people know it, but Do some that. might not. And then what are you doing? And would request you to keep to 10 minutes, please. Absolutely. We're still looking at the time, 3 o'clock. All right, I'd like to stand, though. Can you help? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vinakshi Dalmi. I'm the co-founder of DLRC. Uh, so today's session is about growing popularity of non-formal third space literacy. So what does it even mean, right? So there's the formal section, which is like, you know, the regular schools, and then we have the non-formal, which is what I'm going to talk about, and then there is informal, which is the home section. So, you know, we have the home and the school, and then what we call as other learning spaces, such as now, thanks to COVID, and we've sailed through COVID only because of the non-formal sector, which is online education. So uh, that is what it falls under. So I'll tell you quickly a little bit about DLRC. My theme for today's session is called possibilities because that's what it is. That's what non-formal education sector provides us with, is for possibilities. Uh, DLRC is, uh, is an eight-year-old school. Uh, we can call it a school. And it began as an alternate learning space in May 2015 in a little bungalow in Sus Pune with just one student. No one knew what would happen or where it would grow, except for the fact that the three founders, Ajay, Mona, and Pavan, uh, had a crazy vision, a strong passion for education, and an innate desire to learn. Contagious characteristics, which they continue to spread in DLRC through their facilitation, interactions with parents and children, and mentorship. Unlike usual schools, which have teachers, DLRC has facilitators. They help facilitate learning for themselves and for the students. Facilitation means to guide the search and to embark on a journey of co-learning. It also requires one to be open to learning and humble, but it is not bound by age or qualification. Anyone can be a facilitator. We've had so many alumni who are facilitators of our school. The best parts about being a facilitator at DLRC are that we can make mistakes and learn from them with the support of parents, students, and the founders. All the facilitators at DLRC have a deep passion towards making the vision of the school successful. So that's a little brief about the school. The vision of the school is threefold. The most important is to be a progressive learning hub for continuous learning, cultural immersions, and creative curriculum, where learners can discover their strengths and incubate ideas that create value for the society. The second very big part of our learning process is to be a center of production that develops tangible skills and meets some of the daily needs of our community. And the third one is to be a benchmark, self-sustaining campus, which inspires the community to be active and responsible citizens. As a non-formal third space is literacies, and like today's topic is why are we even growing? Why, is, why are we becoming more popular? I'll show you the reasons why spaces like DLRC, which are non-formal third space literacies, are becoming more popular. And we have to, I'm going to pick on three points. The first one is the sustainable learning. What does it even mean? You know, so the word sustainable has become really narrow. Sustainable is now only connected to eco-friendly uh, things, whereas the word sustainable actually means something that can last for a really long time. So that's what we focus on. We focus on how to learn versus what to learn. And we have integrated life skills in it. The second uh, big point is Kala, which is campus as a learning aid. And the third one is community building. It takes a village to raise a child. So what is sustainable learning? So all of these various things, experiential learning, equal focus on the head, the heart, and the hand, learning approaches, approach with lots of abundance. So you know, this is one very big thing is uh, unfortunately in our formal schooling system, 
we are in a scarcity zone many times because we have a vast syllabus to cover and then the board exams to take care of and things like that. We also, our children also do appear for the board exams, but for some reason and somehow, and hopefully you'll be able to discover, is that we've been able to approach all of this through abundance. Uh, we also focus a lot on work habits, inquiry-based learning, learning from our environment, learning in all of its vastness, and the most important part is continuous learning. So not only the teachers, but also the students are continuously learning uh, throughout the year. The teachers are learning, upgrading their skills and relevant skills, which can help to facilitate what the children need to learn these days, right? So this is really important. Uh, I'll give you some glimpses of what experiential learning will look like in our school. So we go out and we plant rice. Right, so we're not just talking about rice, but we also go and plant rice. Teachers are actually learning what they are going to facilitate. So this is a session where the teachers are actually learning how to facilitate sessions on uh, a very holistic uh, part of our curriculum. Uh, you see many different pictures here and they're full of experiential learning. And there's lots of classroom learning also, but because we have open structures and there are no walls, a lot of learning is in and out of the classroom. So you will see children are really engaged in what they are doing. There are exhibitions going on, lots of art, lots of hands-on activities, theater, music. Children are actually using real tools to cut and build. And that's really rare, but that's, that really works. Then today is, by the way, wishing everybody a very happy International Music and Yoga Day. And today the entire school came together and we did yoga together. So again, many examples of how our children are engaged in experiential learning, book reading, uh, lots of board work, as you see. So this is all part of experiential learning in our school. Uh, we also have, so I, for the past two days, I've been hearing several industry people who are talking about how even our undergrads are not uh, ready to be in the workforce. And that's because they do not have the skills. Uh, and they've been talking about internship. And at DLRC, we start internships from grade nine. So every student from grade nine to 12 have to compulsorily participate in on-campus internships throughout the year and off-campus internships through the summer months. So, uh, and so if you see this data here, I know there's a lot of text here, but we've been able to have children working through the years and even getting paid for the work that they do. Uh, and there are several testimonies here where people who've employed them are really happy to have them back because they did such excellent work. Right, what we truly believe in is that learning happens when a person experiences freedom from fear and of authority. That is why we have flat structures, no hierarchy, no bureaucracy, all the energy spent in doing productive work, right from the founders all the way to the youngest children in our school. Now, this is a very important aspect of our school, which is the Kala. Campus is a learning aid. And as you will, I will show you uh, quickly, our campus is made of reclaimed wood and bamboo structures, and it is immersed in nature. It has got lush green gardens which have been created by the kids and the facilitators alike. We, use, we reuse a lot of things, but most importantly, we reduce the use of several things that we shouldn't be using. So environment responsibility is really important for us. Now you see, we have several eco-friendly uh, aspects on our campus. We have got the bio toilets. Uh, so you see the cycle on top, which is the intact cycle, right? What's happening in our real life is all of our cycles of life are broken. So give you a second to look at that, right? So on the right, you see a cycle that's broken where we eat the food, we discard our waste, and the waste goes into the sewage system, right? Uh, then nothing goes back into the soil. So we have to feed the soil with chemical fertilizer, which goes into our food, which goes into us. So that cycle is there, but it's, what should it ideally be is that what we eat, what we excrete, becomes part of the soil and helps to produce the food that we eat. That's a complete cycle and that's what happens at DLRC. So all of our excreta is converted into compost and it's reused again to grow our food. Uh, we have another system called the biogas system and similarly it's a complete circle where all the food waste, which is uh, cooked food, is used to produce methane gas which is used in the kitchen for cooking tea or whatever we are deciding to cook. 
Now we've got the aquaponic system and we've got lush farms. We're growing so many vegetables on our farms and our children do that. So they're learning all sorts of life skills, right? So life isn't just about employment. Life is also about living. And that's one big skill that we are trying to bring to our students. We also have the vermicompost. Um, and you see, in the construction of a campus, not a single tree was cut. So there is one classroom here. You see, there are five trees in the classroom. And that particular classroom is called the Panchwati. Uh, yeah, and this structure on your right, this is at present the largest freestanding bamboo structure in the whole of Maharashtra. So those are the kind of architectural marvels that we have on our campus, and it's all about possibilities. This is another classroom roof, and you can see there is such intricate work in the roof, and children learn a lot from it. Uh, I think, yeah. And all of our spaces are inhabited by the students. They, they study, they uh, socialize, they talk. That's the picture over there. You see a teacher is actually taking a lesson in the open. And there's complete focus. So greenery actually teaches us to focus. And the last part of my presentation is about community building. And as we all know, it really takes a village to raise a child, which means that for any true learning to happen, it can't happen in uh, solitude. It can't happen in isolation. We, as parents, facilitators, students, and all the community members need to come together to ensure that the children we are trying to educate are getting what they deserve, right? So in any case, today people are looking to build connection. Parents are active participants in our school or in their children's learning. Uh, we have an inclusive environment, all kinds of uh, people, identities, gender, sexuality, uh, orientations, all people are celebrated. And we understand that this is very important for us, especially for the population today. Uh, some really important things that I wanted to bring up here is firstly, we have a non-hierarchical setup, uh, which means what? It means that all of our facilitators and all of our students, they take full ownership of their work, and that is why they excel in what they do. Uh, the second big thing is all the parent community, they view the education of the children as uh, not just like, you know, in a rote learning or in a competitive manner, but as of raising thoughtful and creative individuals. And another really important aspect, do you know why we have chosen to use all natural materials? So that they will disintegrate and the local artisans will get job year after year to rebuild them so that we can generate sustainable employment opportunity within our communities. And there's a very beautiful story about around houses, and it comes from Africa, is, uh, you know, people, as ch children grow, uh, the elders in the community build a roundhouse within which all the boys who've reached puberty sit in, and they learn the various skills that are required to live a life, not to just get employed. And, at the, and after every 10 years or five years, I think the house is actually broken down. And when people ask them, why do you break such a beautiful house? They said, if we do not break this house, we will never pass on the knowledge of building the round house again to the next generation. So it's really important to break so that new things can come up again. We can't have permanency, right? So here are some other pictures about our community. That's a beautiful amphitheater we have. And uh, community coming alive, facilitators being available. Uh, and th these are just some. Uh, testimonies, uh, but I will just like to show you maybe just one video, please, if possible. There are two links here. Is it possible for us to open one? Okay. So uh, what do people say? So DLRC caters to a neglected population of India, the teachers. This is really important. Teachers would ideally love to move out of the factory system and teach creatively, but there are not enough avenues and spaces. At the same time, spaces like DLRC are also a welcome challenge for facilitators as facilitating. I hope you got a chance to read it. I think they're just trying to play the video. Yes, I understand. It's a very short video, in fact. Uh, if it's okay, if it's a problem, it's fine. It doesn't matter. But I hope you got the essence of what DLRC is. And um, 
Yeah. Maybe maybe we Never skip mind. the video, Professor Vinakshi. This, this is not necessary. We can just don't worry about it. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. Yeah, you can all visit our website dlrc.in, and there are lots of videos on our website. You can you might be uh, you might enjoy them. So, can I move to the last slide, please? Thank you. I have one more slide. My. This is not working. Yeah. So I'd like to end with this, that there are endless possibilities. Uh, Non-formal third space literacies are really important, and the reason they're growing is because they show endless possibilities. And uh, our younger generation is watching and learning, so we need to make, ensure that we are giving and we are taking time to weave in all of these beautiful things into the life so we are showing them an abundant life. Thank you so much. You know, as you were talking, I was wondering uh, if I was a child at this point in time, what might it feel like to go to your school? And I know I have kids who are now in college, but what might it have been possibly as experience for them? I don't know if others in the audience felt the same. And I, I know you spoke about this as a progressive K-12 learning space, right? And it's different from traditional schools, of course, but I think there's so many learnings from traditional schools to take away from what you're doing as well. And I know at the start you spoke about, uh, you spoke about how to learn as opposed to what to learn. And even in higher education, and I was at a vice chancellor's uh, round table two weeks ago, and one of the recommendations that this round table came out with is all students in higher education in India should be given uh, the opportunity to learn how to learn before they start college because it's fundamental human skills that sometimes all of us need to develop as well. Okay, so um, I, I, the hall is getting fuller, which is good. Uh, Minakshi, you're up, uh, sorry, Vajanti Sankar, you're up next. And uh, we're gonna be hearing from you around uh, future ready skills. And uh, you're gonna be also talking to us about social emotional skills. Uh, I'm just going to request the audience to settle down, please. Uh, I, th I think you're going to be using slides as well, 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll hear a little bit about chat GPT and generative AI, uh, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. I think we're on track for the 3.45 close. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'll take a cue from Minakshi. I think it's better to stand because it's post-lunch for us too. <laughs> so, right. So uh, I'm also going to give you a lot of examples from K-12 space, but much more like instead of uh, only you know, running a school or pedagogy and so on, I'm going to talk about from the outcomes perspective. Because majority of the work that we do uh, is about assessing, assessments, and as a result, figuring out what sort of learning outcomes really exist in our country for various things, not only academic learning, but also social skills, emotional skills, and what I call as future readiness skills. So I'm going to be bringing you some of that uh, work that we do. Uh, so why uh, do we think that academic skills alone are not enough? I think the first 20 years of my experience in uh, assessments in this country at scale, at large scale, has been in academic learning. But around 2015, we realized that academic learning itself is not going to be enough. And you need to have other types of skills, and therefore, what are these skills? So you actually have the Sustainable Development Goal, which was signed by uh, our Prime Minister Modi also on September 2015. So all of you are aware of Sustainable Development Goals. So it talks about quality education. So the previous 15 years was about access and uh, you know, universalization. But then we realized that children were going to school, but not necessarily learning. So that's why the 2015 SDGs came, and it started talking about quality education. But it doesn't really tell us what quality means. So the Incheon Declaration, which happened subsequently from South Korea, sort of uh, unpacks that. And it says that it's not only literacy and numeracy, but also higher order thinking skills, like critical thinking and problem solving and so on, including creativity, and along with it, interpersonal and social skills. 
So that is the mandate for all countries which signed up for the SDGs that by 2030, that our children in all these schools from K-12 are expected to achieve this. Uh, and NEP also talks about it. So therefore, there is a focus that is happening beyond the academic skills from the policy space. The second thing that you have to be aware of is the mental health and the well-being concerns. All of us are aware of what happened during COVID and a lot of depression and various other issues that came up. But also you will find that the World Health Organization actually says that the mental health is going to be the second largest killer, second only uh, to cardiac diseases in this decade. And we have a number of teenagers, 9.8 million teenagers in this age group of 13 to 17 who suffer from mental health disorders. And this is hard data that has come by. The third reason as to why academic skills alone are not enough is that all of you, you may see that we are all becoming more and more comfortable about living in a virtual world. So you will know that if you are going to a, let us say a restaurant and have a, just a look at the people. So there'll be people coming around, sitting in tables, families coming and sitting in tables. They will give the order and then you'll see that everybody takes out their gadget and they are going through that, scrolling through that, right? So uh, uh, most of it, whether it is the social media, etc., while it has made our connectivity better, but it has also pushed us to live in a virtual world. So we, are, we do not really have relationships. You, uh, to so much so that data says that many families now are single children families or, you know, uh, which means that if there is a single child, it has mother and father, he doesn't know what it is to have siblings. And he, let us say he marries to another single child. So, and look at the children who, who will uh, be, you know, they will be get. That child is not going to know not only what is a brother or a sister, but what is an uncle and what is an aunt. And you know, you look at various words, like for example, I come from Tamil Nadu. So we have different words for different types of aunts. The mother's, brother's, wife is called mommy, whether, whereas the uh, uh, father's sister is called bua or atai. And then perima, peripa, chitti, chittapa, so many relationships. My child is a single child, she does not know these. I worry what my grandchildren will be because they are also not going to know. And they actually data says by 2030, most of the relationships will disappear, or these words will disappear. It will be there only in some uh, archaic dictionary and so on. So virtual life, lack of connections, and which means that we are moving away from many of the things that we knew in the previous generations, but we are not going to have that now. The fourth reason is the industrial revolution. And you all know that the fourth industrial revolution that is going on now is going to be powered by AI, artificial intelligence. There was talk of chat GPT. I will also be talking a little bit about that at a later stage. But you know that world is changing. So in a fast changing world, we in education, whether it be K-12 or whether it be university, we are equipping the students. Students are coming to the colleges and the universities and the schools thinking that they are getting equipped for the future. But are they really getting equipped or are they going to be, uh, you know, uh, not having the skills to manage and survive in this future? That's what we are going to look at. So you look at what is non-formal third space literacies. Non-formal is something that we can understand because it's not in a traditional school or a college system. I started wondering a lot about what you mean by third space literacies. I even tried the chat GPT to explain to, explain to me what a third space literacy is, but I was not very happy with the results that came out. So I was a little happy also, therefore, that human mind is still a little higher than the artificial intelligence. But anyway, so looking at, therefore, as assessment experts, we are often called to assess whether it's large-scale government systems or private school systems or various interventions for impact evaluations and so on in the education space. That means we need to know, really know what we are assessing. If we do not really know deeply what we are assessing, we will not be able to build assessments. So we started work in this area in 2015, and we found we first started working on what we call the social emotional skills, because the SDGs came out at that time. So we wanted to wonder what is the social skills? What are these skills? What are these emotional skills? And you'll find that different people will say different different things. 
So somebody will call empathy as an emotional skill, somebody will call it as a social skill, and you know, a whole range of stuff goes around, and then we started digging into that, not only looking at what exists out in the Western world, driven by psychology and so on, but also in the Eastern world. So we had actually had people coming from all across the world, sitting and reading Sanskrit suktis and uh, Vedic uh, you know, passages, to understand what do we really mean by social skills and emotional skills. Then what is emotional intelligence and social intelligence? Because you know, buddhi is what we call in Hindi and Sanskrit as intelligence. Intelligence. So if that is intelligence, and if that is considered to be cognitive intelligence, then what is this emotional intelligence? You know, things like that. So we came to a conclusion that social skills broadly looks at things that will help you build relationships, whereas emotional skills broadly help you to understand your emotions, understand the other person's emotions, and not only emotions, even underlying the emotion, there's something called as affect. Affect will be something like you feel good or bad. So if you ask a child, your father you know, bet you today, how did you feel? You'll find that uh, children will say, I felt bad, right? As they grow older, they may be able to say that I felt angry or I felt sad, you know, things like that. That happens labeling. So understanding you, your emotions and other person's emotions, including the effect. And also being able to say that, you know, this is anger, but this is not anger. You know, many times you ask people, they'll be able to say that, how did you feel? This is happy. What, how do you feel in this instance? They'll say it's happy. But they will not be able to say in this instance, no, I didn't actually feel happy. It was surprise. You know, that sort of a differentiation and so on. So understanding this bit is called as emotional concept attainment. And then we research further and realize that there is also an emotional regulation piece. Again, when it comes to emotional regulation, you have something called a behavior regulation. That is, you can control how you feel by, you know, like if you're angry, you can go take a few deep breaths and, you know, have a gulp of water, walk around and so on. But can you really change how you feel internally? So behavior, outward behavior is behavior regulation. But what happens internally? Can I really stop feeling angry? Can I really stop feeling sad? So that is called as affect regulation. So these are all what we call as the emotional skills. So that is what we figured out after about five years of research in that area. Then the second aspect that we started embarking in around 2019, just before the COVID hit, was that if the world is changing so much, are we really equipping our children on even cognitive skills, right? What is that the child needs to be future ready on? So that embarked and we went into this uh, space of future readiness skills. So what are these skills that you need to give the child to equip them for future? So you will also find that a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, literature does exist about the need for such things. We will look into what we mean by future readiness skills. So future readiness skills, based on our research, we define it as three broad areas. Thinking skills, relationship skills, and transformational leadership skills. So what I mean by thinking skills? So these skills are something that children learn in classrooms as subjects. So when you talk of defining a problem, you may talk from the perspective of a mathematics or a science, etc. But if you really think about it in real life, everything can be converted to a problem, whether it be about throwing a party or whether it be about, uh, you know, planting a tree or whether it be about growing a garden or whether it be about buying, a, going and buying something from this uh, kalagraha or whatever it is happening. Everything is about figuring out what is the problem. Right? Most often we figure out the symptom, but not necessarily the problem. So you may say that I have a headache, but headache may be a symptom. The underlying problem may be that maybe you're not eating your breakfast every day, you know? So defining the problem. So thinking skills is something that is sort of transversal. It cuts across all domains. It does not need a subject area. So underlying process skills of the brain, of cognition, are thinking skills. So defining a problem, gathering information, Analyzing the pros and cons and coming to a conclusion called critical thinking, then deciding on the strategy that you will employ, decision making, and if it, you're not able to move ahead, looking at alternative pathways, which is creative thinking. So all these five are what we call as thinking skills. And chat GPT now does at least three of them really, really well. And we will talk about what it doesn't do in, uh, in maybe in the question hour. Then you can look at relationship skills. Again, communication. So communication not only means how to write a mail or how to talk, but it also means when to talk and when to keep quiet, right? Even knowing that. So knowing that, looking at verbal communication, paraverbal communication, all the aspects of communication, collaboration, your ability to work in teams, putting other priorities, group priorities before your individual priorities. 
or conflict management. So now it's not only man-to-man -man conflict, it's man-to-animal conflict, man-to-ecology you know, uh, ecology conflict, environment conflict. Now it's also going to be man-to-AI conflict. We are all <laughs> dreading that, right? So these are all what we call as the relationship skills. And the third aspect is what we call as transformational entrepreneurship. So when I came and I saw actually a poster that was kept in, which said that success does not really mean about uh, making lots of money, it is also about making a difference. There was a poster that was kept in. So transformational leadership is a new jargon in leadership. So what it basically means is that if you have to be an effective leader, and if you have to survive and have actually good mental health, then put yourself uh, or set your goal much beyond the narrow thing of becoming a successful business, but actually about changing the world you know, and giving back to the society. So the skills that are related to that, like initiative, mastery orientation, gratification, delaying the gratification and accountability and so on. So all these skills are transversal skills. All these skills can be taught from grade one upwards. Now, though we developed the tool for, you know, adolescent children, and we have tested it in wide, uh, you know, across uh, multiple states and so on, which I'll be sharing, we also find that even for our recruitment purposes, this is one of the greatest indicators. So uh, what, uh, how do we unpack or how do we mainstream these literacies? So I still didn't get an answer to the third space literacy. I probably understood it as uh, it's called third space, spa third space because it's probably provided by third party players. You know, in a, in a system, uh, education system, the government is considered to be the first one to be providing education and uh, you know, the public education and so on, probably the third party players, which are non-formal, are probably coming into third space literacies. So the future readiness skill was undertaken by this group called Life Skills Collaborative. It's a very large group of about 18 partners in this country. And we have tested these assessment skills across four states and 18 partners. And states are adopting to teach these future readiness skills now. And lots of partners are building curriculums for that. And similarly, UNICEF, along with uh, uh, you know, Michael Susan Dill Foundation and others came up with something called as Young Warrior Next or UA. So again, there are about 22 partners and 11 states in India which are embarking on this, and all of them are using our tool. The second aspect I told you, the social emotional skills, was again uh, conducted for five years of research all across India, and many of these reports are there out in the public domain. Uh, so if you visit our site, cssl.global, you'll be having access to that. This looks at not only social emotional skills, it looks at positive attitudes children have, it looks at school climate and environment that is there apart from learning outcomes. Now, what are the issues uh, one has when you start accessing, I mean, assessing these skills? So you may have, even be, as an university or as a school, you may even start building a curriculum for that. But more importantly, can you really assess them? So, for example, if you ask somebody, are you empathetic? If I ask somebody, are you empathetic? You'll say, of course, yes. But probably your neighbor doesn't agree with you, right? Or you may be empathetic in the morning, but not in the afternoon. You may be empathetic to your old man, but not to a young child. You know, you're, it is a moving construct. It's very dynamic. It doesn't stay for, you know, stable for measuring. Then there is something where you call it a Hawthorne or the Sentinel effect. So if I'm going to be judging you on empathy, and you know that I'm going to be measuring you on empathy, of course you will behave well. Of course you will write that mail with a much more toned down language, et cetera, right? So when, somebody fe when everybody feels that they are going to be judged or when they feel that they are going to be evaluated, then you really do cannot measure because what you will get is a very false positive. Then there are question types. So we found that across the world, whatever when you look at assessments here, it will be all like Likert scales. Every morning when you get up, do you really feel good? You know, how, how many times in a day did you get angry, but you did, your, did not show it out? Sometimes, every day, you know, it goes like that. So therefore, you will always give aspirational answers. And uh, more often, we found that some of the good tests would require a one-on-one -on -one administration, where there's a psychotherapist or a psychologist sitting, and therefore, it's not only from the test they are able to come to a conclusion about you, but they're also observing you and looking at your behavior and so on. So uh, the tools that we had developed has been presented in about 43 country, uh, you know, research universities across the world, right from the Harvard all the, all the way uh, the east to the west coast of US and various other organizations. And uh, I'll skip this slide, just to show that a lot of validation has been done and so on. Uh, I'll just give you one sample item for you to sort of ponder about. If an assessment is there, 
to check whether you can manage conflict. How does that assessment item look like? While playing cricket, Mohan got out. But he wanted to continue batting because the bat belonged to him. His friends didn't want this. But Mohan told them that if they did not allow him to continue batting, he would take his bat and go home. What should Mohan's friends do? Have you faced this type of thing when you used to play? Right? Now, look at the options. Option A says, they should ask Mohan to leave and instead play something else with the ball. B says, they should let Mohan play as long as he wishes to and later request him to give the bat. C, they should offer Mohan another chance to bat after everyone's batting is over. D, they should tell Mohan that he was mean, cancel the game and go home. How many of you say A? B? You please lift your hands clearly. How many of you say B? C? D? Right? So, is there a correct answer? So, when you talk about these types of measurements, there may not necessarily be a correct answer. But it looks at there are certain ways you think and you have certain skills of being able to handle conflict, which will all fall into different patterns. So our feedback would be given based on those patterns. Uh, this is another item. This, I'll just have one or two more slides. Your mother packed your favorite food for school. During the break, you accidentally spilled it on the ground before even taking a bite. How would you feel? Right? So these types of contexts are provided. Then it looks out to see whether you're able to connect to the real emotion related to that. So this is uh, my last concluding slide. So what did we find from doing all these large scale assessments all across India, even in Maldives, in South Asia, and even in Eastern and Southern African countries and so on, what did we find? We find that thinking skills are the weakest among all the future readiness skills. Even less than 25% of acquisition. That means our children are not able to identify a problem, they cannot gather relevant information, they cannot critically think to analyze the pros and cons and come to conclusion. They cannot decide and more so they cannot think or have creativity to find alternate solutions. Less than 25% can do this. That means chat GPT can very, very easily replace them. Leadership is the second weakest. Among SEL skills, among social emotional skills, relationship skills was the weakest. Less than 40% was acquired. That means we do not know how to, uh, you know, have relationships. Again, the impact of the virtual world. More importantly, the one thing we found which sort of uh, was a shocker for us was that we all know that in academic learning, there's a lot of rote learning that goes on and so forth. But our research actually showed us that you can rote learn emotions. You can rote learn emotions. That means if somebody says, every time your daddy buys you a cake, you have to feel happy. So you can keep convincing yourself, because daddy got me a cake, I feel happy. But such children could not say that they actually felt good. You know, those types of disconnects were there. So rote learning of emotions is happening, which is very, very dangerous. 16% of variation of academic scores can be explained by social emotional skills. So therefore, what I would like to conclude my talk on is that when there are so much implication of these skills on the future of the children, and with so much work that is going on in the non, uh, you know, third spaces or non-formal spaces, it's high time it actually gets into the curriculum and gets formalized and proper curriculums be set and proper assessments to be followed on to ensure that our children are really getting the skills that they should. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I know Professor Shavin, you need to leave, so maybe we can say, let you exit at this time, and then we'll continue the panel. Yeah, I know you have a flight to catch. Thank you so much, and safe travels. Um, Dr. Sharon, we would like to felicitate you with a small token of, uh, the small token of appreciation. Uh, Bhama ma'am, our Dean, Admin, 
Our Dean uh, Academics and Administration, may I please request you to give Dr. Sharon a small token of her appreciation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, the hall is getting fuller, which is good. I'd request everybody to please settle down. I've been told we have a few extra minutes, and I'm playing the dual role of moderator and also a panel member. So I'll go next, and it might be a topic that might interest you. So let's get started. Could I request everybody in the back to please, there are lots of seats here. You can find seats here if you like. And uh, yeah, let's, let's get started. Uh, so how many of you have used ChatGPT? Uh, show of hands, please. All students, I would guess? Yeah, more hands? OK. So I'm asking a question. I don't know the answer, but let's ask a question. Can generative AI revolutionize higher education? And I know many of you spoke about many of the new things that are happening and uh, what are the challenges that we are facing. Um, this is very new, which is why it's a question. It's not like a definitive point of view. But let's look a little bit at some of the topics that we know. So I'll cover three things. Uh, I think many people already know what ChatGPT is, but let's t take a moment to talk about what is generative AI. Uh, what are some of the opportunities and challenges in higher education, but also in industry? How are skills changing? How is work changing? And what might it mean in generative AI? And I'll show you a little bit of what Coursera is doing with generative AI and ChatGPT as well. Uh, so let's start with a definition. Uh, generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that can create new content, right? ChatGPT is one type of generative AI. It does this by learning from a very large data set. It crawls the entire internet before it comes up with those answers. And it looks at existing content, and then it uses that data to generate similar new content, right? Just the basic one-on-one -on -one of what generative AI is. And like I said, ChatGPT is what we probably use, but it's one form of generative AI. Salm Altman is the CEO of a company called OpenAI that launched ChatGPT. You can't read the text, please don't try. The reason I put this tweet here is because it says a date, December 1st, 2022. So ChatGPT was made available to the world on December 1st, 2022. It's not been too long since all of us started getting to know this. And what's really interesting is this, right? If you look at the pace at which adoption has happened, Spotify, Instagram, ChatGPT, 1 million users, 10 lakh users in five days, right? And today, after about five, six months of chat GPT, the total number of users is about 10 crore users, right? That's the pace at which this technology is getting adopted. And many people are saying this is fundamentally new technology. It is as fundamental as Google search, as the iPhone, and now possibly generative AI chat GPT. And it is important for us to think about this a moment and say, is this going to impact how we live our lives, how we conduct higher education as well? OK, so chat, designed to make us feel as if a human is responding. We probably experience that if you're using chat GPT. Generative, because it does create new content after crawling the internet and coming back with everything. It is pre-trained on a very, very large data set. If you're using chat GPT 2.5, 3.5, and so on, it's still 2021. ChatGPT4 is starting to use uh, later versions of the internet. And then, of course, it's a transformer, which is a category of generative AI models. This is a text-only, a language-only model if you've used ChatGPT. You can also create images using ChatGPT, not ChatGPT, but other generative AI platforms. And then there are also now video making capabilities coming in generative AI. I'm not going to talk about those today, but let's. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this a little bit. So, I mean, from whatever your experience has been, are you excited about chat GPT in higher education? Just answer number one. I mean, a show of hands again, if I could just get a little bit of a pulse check. Are you excited about it? OK. Uh, uh, excited folks can put their hands down. Are you worried about it? Teachers, students cheating on all of your essays and all of your long form answers. OK. And are you unsure? How many people are unsure? So it's a little bit of a one third, one third, one third. Uh, let's see if I can move some of the understanding a little bit uh, through this conversation. So firstly, in terms of opportunities and challenges, uh, let's 
take a little bit at how industry is changing uh, before we talk about how I, higher education will change. This is World Economic Forum in Davos this year, uh, January this year, right? Industry started talking about chat GPT in January this year. Just very, very recently, right? It's changing very, very quickly. And we've probably seen some of these headlines, right? Um, this is industry talking about AI arms race, um, um, you know, revolution in intellectual uh, thinking. Is it coming for your job? I know, Ajanti, you were talking about this a little bit. But for campuses, it's largely sent shockwaves so far, right? Many faculty members have said, look, I can't trust these answers that are coming from students. So we know there are enough challenges that this is generating. It's also changing how work happens as well. And let's take a look at how that might be happening. This is a slightly busy chart. It comes from Oxford University. It is predating COVID. This is a chart from 2017. You can't read it, but let me tell you the key messages. Low-skilled jobs are at risk of automation, right? This was happening even before COVID came in. So if you were a cashier in a bank, it got automated. If you were somebody working in a warehouse doing picking, it got automated. In the US, it's expected that truck driver jobs will get automated. It is expected that real estate agents will get automated. So all jobs which are low skills on the right-hand side uh, are the ones that were getting automated. And what universities teach is on the top left, which is financial managers, general managers, coders, IT managers, et cetera. And in India, of course, agriculture would probably come on the right hand side a little bit. And what these people were doing is they were gaining knowledge, skills, and credentials from higher education to move to the left. Right? This is happening before COVID. This was happening even during COVID and with digital, uh, digitalization. But now with ChatGPT coming in, this chart has changed a little bit because for the first time, a lot of those people who are on the left, financial managers, general managers, people like me, you know, general managers of companies, our jobs are getting threatened as well because ChatGPT is saying, look, high skilled jobs are at the risk of automation as well. And the kind of skills that you were talking about as well are going to change quite rapidly if this takes um, effect at the pace at which it is coming because keep in mind, December 1st, 2022, is when we all started experiencing something called chat GPT. Now, what this means, so yeah, OpenAI is very smart. They got into a study with the University of Pennsylvania, and they said, look, instead of somebody else telling what our product is going to disrupt, we will tell you what our product is going to do. And they roughly said half of all jobs will have half of their work, which is going to change, right? Significant amount of change is going to happen. And if you're earning higher, then chances are that your job will get impacted more. And this includes a lot of faculty members and academic leaders as well. But your jobs are going to get impacted as a result of some of this technology, which is coming very quickly as well. And I'll not get into skills in terms of what this is impacting, because I know we heard from Vaijanti quite a bit. For students, and I know there are many, many students here, uh, there was a survey done. 43% students said, I've used a tool like this. 22% said, um, they've used it to complete assignments or exams. And then 32% said uh, they intend to continue to using some of these tools. And so many institutions are figuring out, look, how do we now manage some of this, right? What are the challenges that this is throwing up? And I don't know if the answers are out there, but these are some of the big challenges that we are likely to see. Let's quickly look at a little bit of opportunities this is creating as well. And I'll very quickly show you what Coursera is doing in terms of integrating the power of uh, ChatGPT into Coursera. Now we are saying, look, a learner can have a personalized coach which will sit in the learning experience, and I won't show that in the interest of time. Um, but a faculty member can have 20 teaching assistants, 30 teaching assistants available to you by integrating the power of ChatGPT as you create content, as you define curricula, as you engage with students. We are calling it Course Builder, and there's a three, three and a half minute video which, we'll, which uh, hopefully it will work. But let's show you how this can translate into turbocharging the course building experience for faculty members. Can we get audio?
Just try pausing and maybe playing again. Let's meet Jenny. Jenny wants to help her learners grow their leadership skills. She has some of her own content to get started with, and she knows Coursera can take what she has and build an engaging private course in only a few clicks. Here is how we're helping Jenny. She can build her course manually or save time by getting assistance. Coursera's easy authoring helps Jenny build out the content. She can tell her what she wants the course to be about and the skills she wants learners to gain. For example, a leadership course covering skills including communication, team building, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. In addition to her content, Jenny is also looking to include video clips from participating partners to supplement her private course and make it more interesting and relevant for her learners. She can add her files as source materials, such as recordings of previous lectures, training sessions, or written documents like a syllabus or a list of skills. Now, Jenny is ready to generate a course draft. Coursera will analyze her inputs and create the course structure, generate content from her uploads, recommend existing Coursera content to include, and apply pedagogical best practices. Through easy authoring, a first draft of the course was created for Jenny based on the input she gave it, and now she can review and edit the content. There are a few modules. Some videos that are from her upload, which were split into shorter clips, alongside videos from other authors, and an auto generated reading and assignment. Let's take a look at the first video. This is a clip of just the introduction from Jenny's original upload. The preview includes an auto generated summary derived from the transcript and highlights to jump to each video segment. Jenny can adjust the way the video was trimmed and tweak the summary. She can also edit the generated transcripts and skills that are attached to this video. She can check out the videos from other participating institutions that were suggested to add to the course. This one looks interesting. Jenny can watch the preview, read the summary, or skip to the highlighted segments of the video to get a quick sense of it. She can also look through other alternatives by telling Coursera what she's looking for, such as finding the most popular videos about Module 1. It suggested three other videos. After previewing them, she can decide which ones to use to supplement her course. A reading was also auto-generated with a glossary of keywords based on the content in this module. An assignment was auto-generated based on the transcript of the uploaded videos and other content in the module, which is great because it will have taken her a long time to build these from scratch. She can add more questions to create more options for variability. Once Jenny is ready to launch the course, she can review the auto-generated course name, description, skill tags, and logo. Now, Jenny's private custom course is live, and learners at her organization are on their way to growing their leadership skills. Jenny can't believe how easy it was for her to create an engaging private course in Coursera. Our vision is to streamline customized course creation for educators and customers like Jenny using a plan of content to meet learners' unique needs. So that's the idea, you know, give the power of the platform, couple it with ChatGPT, and pretty much, like I said, 
give the power of 20, 30 teaching assistants to each faculty member to turbocharge the content that, you, that they're creating. Um, I think in the interest of time, that's all I have. Uh, I would just say, you know, it's a pretty uh, big new age. Uh, so please do take the time to understand what this is and see if it is meaningful for you. Um, I've been told we have eight minutes before we need to conclude. So we could take maybe a few audience questions. Uh, I think we have mics to go around. We've heard a diverse range of topics in this panel so far. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please put your hand up. I know we have one question there. Uh, I'd ask you to introduce yourself and uh, ask a question briefly. If you want to direct it to a specific uh, panel member, please uh, do so. Otherwise, I will uh, share it with the, uh, with the team. Uh, yeah, if you could get a mic there. OK, let's go with you first, and then a mic to that lady over there. Please go ahead. Yeah, but my greetings to all the panel members who are sitting over there, panel speakers. Uh, my name is Dr. Abhay Singh Chauhan, and I am from School of Management Science, uh, sorry, uh, Symbiosis Center for Management Studies, Pune. And uh, 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 very beautifully explained by Paul Henry about the distance learning program that he is going through in his university, right, and how he has revolutionized the distance program over the years. Uh, if we talk about Professor Minakshi as well, so she talked about the experience. Uh, Could I request you to come to your questions? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just uh, coming on to that. So she talked about the experiential uh, learning as well and classroom teaching as well. So my question is on the other aspect, and that is on the evaluation part. And uh, how we'll ensure the unethical practices which has been followed, right, and uh, how we can remove it uh, from this non-formal third space literacy. Uh, because uh, it is very important for us to understand that the unethical practices which has been followed in terms of uh, assisting or in terms of cheating in the evaluation part, right? So these so unethical wonderful. practices. If I could come to both of you, I think, uh, sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah. you, but I got the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, from an open university standpoint, as you think about assessments and you know making sure those are ethically done, there's no cheating, both in open university higher education and then in K-12, how are you uh, both thinking about it? Maybe we start with you, Professor Paul. Thank you very much. Our experience uh, has been that uh, we, we have to... Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for settling down. We've had the dignitaries join us. I'll let you come back to your answer, please. Thank you, moderator. I was saying that uh, we, in our experience over the last four and a half years, we have adopted a number of um, models of assessment which we believe uh, ensure quality and, um, and a high standard. Now, in an open university, the, the, there are models, for instance, multiple uh, choice questions, which are, of course, um, um, taken through, yes, into create, we create a bank, um, a number of versions are created, constituting, let's say, 40% of the total summative contribution. And um, these have to go through quality testing. Um, they have to go through a, a team of professors who really ensure that they are accurate. And then they are loaded into the computer system. And when we have them written, they are marked by the computer. And, and so there is no human interface. And that's very exact. However, you, you have such objective tests you also have others. It depends on what you, are, you want to, uh, to assess. Um, it's a variety of skills that you would want to assess. For instance, um, if you want to see how uh, critical thinking is applied within a context by the student, it's important then we, for us to use e-portfolios, um, a portfolio-based evidence, uh, based portfolio, 
which shows that the student has been interacting with the learning environment uh, and taking things like um, a video of yourself using your phone. It need not be a sophisticated video machine. You use your phone, you record your, yourself, and then you upload onto the learning management system and the lecturer can interface with it. Uh, it's, it's a number of uh, creative experiments that we have been using to make sure that the standard and quality is ensured and that we don't have students who graduated who, who, who are considered to be lower than the other students in contact university. I, I could go on and on, but uh, I want to In, in to the give, interest of time, uh, yes. I've been asked to yeah. uh, conclude. Uh, I know we are running over and we are getting ready for the next session as well. So I'm just going to, uh, uh, no, I'm going to skip and maybe take that one on one. I'd really like to thank the panel. Uh, we've heard a diverse range of topics from K-12 to open university to on campus and also across the skills landscape. And thank you so much for listening to us. I think we're ready to get into the next session. Uh, we'll close with that. Thank you so much. Palestate our esteemed panel. Thank you so much. This was such an interesting session from school to higher education, COIL, journey of the Zimbabwe Open University, DLRC, social emotional skills, so much to learn. And thank you once again so much. And of course, Chat GPT, which has become an integral part of all academic discussions. May I request Dr. Rajni Gupte, our Vice Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Symbiosis International Deemed University to kindly give a small token of appreciation to our guest. Mr. Raghav Gupta. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Gudnani. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Professor Dalmia. Professor Sankar. Thank you so much. And we will begin with the next session. <laughs>